ignorance, one's own lack of knowledge or information. It's a word that couldn't get any simpler, one that very much applies to the Sega Saturn, probably the most misunderstood console in gaming history. It's not hard to see where this attitude comes from. It wasn't successful in the West, with fewer than 350 of its games releasing in the US and PAL regions in its short three-year lifespan. It sold less than a combined 4 million units in those regions, resulting in what's probably the lowest market share percentage of any major video game console. Any old YouTube video about the Saturn that you can draw out of a hat will tell you three main things about the console. 1. The hardware was suddenly changed last minute to compete with the PlayStation's 3D performance, making it hard to develop for. 2. The console was an unmitigated commercial failure. And 3. Its library was lacking in compelling games, with anything good on the Saturn also on PlayStation. One of them is true, but missing some crucial details, while the others have a grain of truth with everything surrounding it ignoring context or just being an outright lie. Thus, I think the way most people view the system and what it's all about is unfairly skewed against it, and personally, I think the Saturn deserves better than that. So today, I want to try and properly analyse these key points. We'll dive into the reasons behind the hardware design, its commercial lifespan in the East, and finally, its expansive library of exclusives, as well as multi-platform games that were at their best on the Saturn. The story about the console's creation is often told like this. Sega started development of Project Saturn, a 32-bit CD-based console sometime in 1992. Initially devised as a 2D system and having its design redone at the last hour, in some sort of rush and desperate attempt to match Sony's upcoming PlayStation in 3D performance. Specifically, the two video display processor chips made its graphics power harder to tap into, and drove up the cost of manufacturing to the point that Sega literally could not make it cheaper than the PlayStation, one of the many reasons attributed to its failure. As it turns out, none of that's really true. There's evidence of magazines as early as 1993 talking about the Saturn's 3D performance, over a year before its Japanese release. Back then, before the PlayStation had even been publicly unveiled, the Saturn was set to far outstrip the Super FX in 3DO, so that already doesn't hold too much water. Plus, for a while, the Saturn was cheaper than the N64 in Japan, it was also cheaper than the PlayStation up front, since the Saturn was bundled with Virtua Fighter for 44,800 yen, whereas the PlayStation costed 39,800 yen, but any games for it were sold separately at launch. So that indicates there could have been other reasons to the infamous price gap between PlayStation and Saturn in the West. I'm not sure what that could have been exactly, but it's food for thought if nothing else, showing that there's more to $2.99 than what many of us may have thought. It could have been more expensive to cover the cost of rushing out the marketing, or maybe they had to try and profiting off console sales since there were so few games at launch. It could honestly be some combination of those things, but who can say for sure? Meanwhile, Liverpool-based computer game monolith Psygnosis had been bought by Sony earlier in the year and were reportedly not very happy with the state of the console, deemed not fit for purpose by co-founder Ian Hetherington. It's at this point in 1993 that Psygnosis got involved with the development of the PlayStation hardware. Psygnosis was publishing dev tools for the Amiga and Atari ST created by Bristolian company SN Systems. So when Sony bought Psygnosis, they all of a sudden had a working relationship with a company who would go on to provide toolchains for PlayStation development, compatible with standard Windows PCs. Sony had originally intended games to be developed on their own Unix-based news workstations, which were quite expensive, so SN Systems made developing for the PlayStation much cheaper and easier than it would have been otherwise. In fact, the company is still around today and has provided Windows-based toolchains for all of Sony's consoles since, even double-dipping with competitors. Let's assume mid-93 really was a last minute for the Saturn's development cycle, and that this is that fabled moment they completely changed course to compete with the PlayStation. Then, by that logic, the PlayStation had also gone through some apparently last minute troubles of its own. In reality, it didn't, and neither did the Saturn. The truth is, the hardware for Saturn had been designed with clear intent and purpose for 3D games from the start, just like the PlayStation. The use of two CPUs in graphics chips, with two more CPUs, one for I.O. and another for the sound hardware, with the Saturn Control Unit DSP rounding things out, is completely ridiculous for a game console. But it makes total sense when you look at the way Sega designed their arcade hardware. Sega constructed their super scalers as well as the model series boards in such a way that the only intensive thing the CPU has to do is process game logic. Complex graphics tasks like scaling, rotation and distortion of sprites, or the construction of polygons and drawing of textures are done on separate chips specialised for such tasks. True, the CPU still has to tell the chips what to draw, but they can do so much, much faster than the CPU. 
So much so that the bump in performance provided by Sega's engineering prowess was invaluable in pushing early 3D games in general, let alone just in the arcades. So it was only natural for Sega to pursue 3D for their 5th gen console, considering their own brushes with 3D in the arcades. It's not like Sega never saw the 3D revolution coming, far from it. So if they knew how to design revolutionary hardware for revolutionary 3D games, what went wrong? Well, that's the thing, they only had experience in bringing such things to the arcades. Let's assume for a second that the Saturn really was cheaper and easier to make than the PlayStation. There's still the problem that Sega were one of the few companies to know how to properly use it. Sure, the hardware was capable of incredible things, but how many other companies aside from Sega were used to creating games in this kind of hardware environment? The answer, unsurprisingly, turned out to be very few. Sega may have been used to creating games in this manner for close to a decade, but most everyone else was not. Instead, they favoured a more conventional setup of a main and sub-processor, graphics chip, and one or two more for sound, executing commands in batches. Western developers in particular were quite vocal about how difficult it was to create games for the Saturn. By this time, pretty much every Western dev had moved away from the arcades and into the home console and PC markets. They were used to a more simpler, more streamlined approach, which apart from being easier to develop for, also didn't carry huge costs associated with designing and manufacturing arcade boards, or licensing use of another company's design. So they had no reason to learn such fancy parallelization techniques. Which makes it clear why so few of the Saturn's games came from the West, and where the big gap in the system's library lays. 70% of the system's 1,000 game library never left Japan, so it's easy to guess that the Japanese, being the industrious lot that they are, fared a bit better with Sega's machine. 2D was still very popular among Japanese developers, so the Saturn's superior 2D performance was very enticing to those looking to create RPGs, shooters, platformers, etc. Utilising its 2D prowess with some light 3D peppered throughout was often the golden ticket, striking a perfect balance between game design, art style, and technical demonstration, while often showing more confident execution than many 3D titles on any console of the time, let alone the Saturn. Games like Radiant Silvergun took this approach, making a much nicer fit for the console than grafting a 3D PlayStation game onto it. 2D games are easier to make, especially on the Saturn, where 2D just so happened to be much more doable than 3D, despite not being the system's initial focus. Confronting a paradigm shift like 3D game design on hardware with strict demands wasn't exactly an enticing idea. So creating a game in this manner, while arguably playing it safe, means that such titles from this era have aged much better than their polygonal counterparts. While I'm not exactly sure where Saturn was a 2D machine comes from, I'm willing to bet that the sheer volume of quality 2D titles had something to do with people speculating as such. Especially considering how much more impressive, polished, and even playable the Saturn's 2D games normally are, compared to its 3D ones. Given that YouTube is mostly made up of English language content, it's very easy to see that very western outlook on the industry shaping the way video games are discussed on the platform, especially when it comes to the Saturn. Most videos that mention the Saturn in passing are usually very dismissive and quite often uninformed about the Saturn's success in Japan. Sega's decision to rush a western launch for the console months before it was ready was probably the worst decision the company ever made, and cost them the PAL and US markets for the entirety of the generation. It's day zero. The day the Titan fell. May 11th, 1995. The first day of the very first E3. I guarantee you every 22 year old in North America knows what a sphincter is. The 20 games originally promised for the September 2nd launch was reduced to a mere 6, the marketing was weak, and a limited number of units that shipped to a limited number of dealers ruined Sega's relationship with retail partners. However, in Japan, it was a little different. Instead of a shock launch that Sega themselves weren't even ready for, the Saturn had a more conventional launch in Japan on November the 22nd, 1994. The launch library wasn't the most compelling thing in the world, but a port of Virtua Fighter, albeit with some corners cut, was enough to make the console sell out quickly on launch day. As with any console, it would take time to build a library that would make the console worth investing in. That would come to the Japanese Saturn in time, since third party support was actually pretty decent over there, but we'll get to that later. Sega were at the top of their game post-launch, so much so that the Saturn's Japanese launch was the most successful in their history, before becoming their most successful console in Japan. In fact, the Saturn would, if not overtake the PlayStation's market share, at least hover very closely to it up until mid to late 1996. So for a good year and a half to two years, the Saturn was actually close to being the number one console in the region. Sony, while facing an uphill battle, were nonetheless gaining ground and things would change towards the end of the generation. The PlayStation would garner a more compelling library by late 96, and when Final Fantasy VII was eventually released in early 1997, then it was all over for Sega's interstellar dream, even in Japan. 
but while Sega did eventually succumb to the PlayStation's hand in the region, it did hold significant victory over the N64. You may question that significance, since the Saturn only sold 200,000 units more. And while that's understandable, the thing is, unit sales doesn't define any console's success, at least not on its own. In case you forgot, console manufacturers sell their hardware at a loss, and then make money on selling games for the system later down the line. A console's price needs to be low so consumers can easily invest in it, and the games need to reach a high level of quality, quantity, and variety to keep those same consumers interested in buying them. So then, by looking at the number of games released in Japan on each platform, a different story emerges. Treasure, Technosoft, Hudson, Atlas, Capcom, Konami, Rising, Success, and many more gave generous support to the console, releasing a decent number of games between 1995 and 2000. A lot of these games, naturally, showcased the Saturn's 2D prowess quite well. The Saturn had the best versions of Capcom's fighting games, exclusive ports of seminal shooters like Battle Garaga or Layer Section, RPGs, Suikoden, Grandia, Luna, etc., and a healthy library of original titles made with it in mind. These genres were, and still are, major driving forces behind Japanese game sales. Very few games in these genres, if at all, appeared on the 64, and any games that were successful on the console were either drip-fed Nintendo titles, or entries into series or genres that were only popular in the West. Even ignoring how powerful the 2D games were in Japan, Nintendo just launched the console too late for it to have an impact in the same way the Saturn did. By the time it shambled its way onto eastern shelves on June 23rd, 1996, Sega and Sony had already sold consoles, built up great libraries, and pushed CDs into the video game mainstream for a year and a half. Meaning the three first-party games that launched on the cartridge-based system in Japan was pitiful compared to the hundreds of in-house and third-party titles that Sega and Sony already had under their belt. Since Nintendo were basically learning how to make 3D games as they went, they experienced lots of problems with software drought, requiring much more time, money, and manpower for each project. Something they couldn't really afford considering the sheer lack of third-party developers that embraced the console, especially Japanese third parties. As opposed to Sega, who found 3D development a fair bit easier, especially since some of their teams had already been working on 3D games for quite a while. So, with all this stacked against it, the N64 only had 198 games released for it in Japan, meaning more than half of the system's library is missing. I'm not kidding you when I say that's less than the amount of games released in Japan for the 3DO. All in all, the Saturn's library, being close to four times that size and including games you actually wanted to play, was much more enticing to Japanese gamers than the 64. That's not to say Nintendo wasn't more successful than the 3DO, because it absolutely was. It's just that, relative to its contemporaries, it didn't have much to offer, so most people who bought one didn't get much out of it. The Saturn would end up maintaining a much higher attach rate and market share throughout its life in the East than the N64 for the whole generation. Now, it's not like the Saturn was overall more successful than the N64. While Nintendo losing Japan was a big hit, their distant but still commendable second place in the West kept them afloat for the generation, coming out the other side bruised, but largely unscathed. Whereas Sega was seen in Japan more as an arcade studio and didn't have much of a foothold in the Japanese home market until the Saturn. Sega's previous consoles had failed against Nintendo and even NEC's offerings in prior generations, so while the Saturn's success is great considering its odds, it's perhaps a slightly hollow victory. They'd spent all that time finally cementing themselves as a player in the Japanese console space, only to lose their much more profitable Western markets, markets where the PS1, and to a much lesser extent the N64, would come to dominate. Make no mistake, the Saturn's commercial failure in the West is what hurt them the most in the long run, even its Japanese mother base. In some ways, I get why people don't feel bad for them after the mistakes they made. Not just the shock E3 launch, but everything leading up to it did them no favours either. Particularly the fallout from the 32X, a mushroom cloud whose blast radius largely didn't reach the east, since Sega of Japan more or less buried the thing on arrival. But the Saturn's eastern success, while a small one that cost them their most loyal customers, was sufficient to keep the company alive and flush enough with cash that they could try just one more time. So yes, it was a commercial failure, and their domestic success wasn't enough to turn a healthy profit, but it's not like it sank them immediately, or unmitigated as I put it. Sega was definitely the company to suffer the most throughout the fifth generation, but their financial woes weren't the result of the Saturn console itself. If it was, it wouldn't have achieved the success that it did in Japan, as fleeting as it was. So you might think the Dreamcast is what really killed Sega, but it wasn't either. What killed them instead was a lack of Western consumer trust, caused by distribution and marketing mishaps, not just from the Saturn, but also from the 32X's quite public Western failure in particular. You might also say that it's the PS2's monstrous success that did it, but the GameCube and Xbox would have cannibalized the Dreamcast's chance regardless, because their mistakes during the Saturn's life had finally caught up with them in big ways.
Oh, also something something, the lack of a mainline Sonic game on the Saturn contributed to its failure, but who cares? Rendering a fully 3D environment at a smooth frame rate on the Saturn is a mighty challenge. The CPUs can handle display lists on their own just fine, but the various compromises present in VDP1 makes drawing complex scenes entirely with polygons quite hard. Though I haven't really found a PlayStation port to the Saturn that runs at a horrifically dire frame rate in comparison, it's still much harder to get to grips with the system's quirks just to achieve the same results as a PlayStation game. Which makes it surprising that Aussie developer Tantalus Interactive managed a relatively convincing version of House of the Dead on the Saturn. This game originated on Sega's Model 2 arcade board, which has far more powerful 3D hardware under its belt than the Saturn. Combine that with the fact that a third party did the conversion, it's perhaps no surprise that this version isn't as polished as it could have been. Character models and textures have obviously been hit the hardest, but it's still nonetheless possibly close to the arcade original. That being said, this game makes clear the kind of sacrifices that most developers made to their 3D Saturn games in order to make them run well. While the presentation of the game is still mostly intact, the many little flaws as a result of what could be either hardware and or developer limitations do add up. The textures in particular leave a lot to be desired, with some being laughably low res, even for the Saturn. Overall, it's not bad, but it's definitely an example of how some things can go a bit wrong if you don't have the resources or expertise to dance around the Saturn's unconventional limitations. Nevertheless, it's still a house of the dead at its core, and it's games like this with addicting arcade gameplay, flying in the face of underwhelming visuals that really define what the system is all about. An engaging, addictive arcade gameplay loop that's reason to play the game in and of itself, to see the score climb and test how many people you can rescue on a stage. And if nothing else, this version of the game does give me a sense of national pride. It's not often that you see a group of Aussie devs with enough talent pull off a tall order such as this. While House of the Dead may have been asking a bit much from both the Plucky Machine and the Freshman Dev team, the Saturn's best 3D games make more economical use of the Saturn's hardware. This is an in-house port of the first entry in Sega's cult classic Virtualon series, debuting on the Model 2 in January of 96, then getting ported to the Saturn in November. Apart from being a fun as all get out arcade mech fighting game, it's a good showcase for how polished the Saturn's 3D games could look. Granted, it's not pushing the Saturn to its polygon limits, but it doesn't exhibit many of the quirks that people usually associate with the console's 3D games. Poor frame rates, blocky textures, chunky, low poly models, etc. Since the environments are mainly flat floors rendered by VDP2, VDP1 doesn't have to spend anywhere near as much time rendering every scene in punishing detail as it did on House of the Dead. Instead, it only renders a few polygons in the environment, then spends the rest of its time rendering more detailed character models without significantly reducing the frame rate. Then VDP2 just needs to draw the background, the HUD, and a flat plane. Hey presto, you have a good looking, albeit kinda sparse, 3D scene that runs well. It doesn't quite stack up to the Model 2 in terms of graphics and frame rate, but its intended presentation is still entirely there, which is what's most important at the end of the day. The Saturn would, through such clever use of hardware features, show similarly impressive efforts. Sega's port of Virtua Fighter 2 is notable for running in 480i at 60fps, with character models showing more detail than many other games in the system. I haven't quite gotten Virtua Fighter yet, so I can't entirely speak for how it plays, but it's still very good from what I hear. And considering the resolution and frame rate, the port job of VF2 here is nonetheless commendable, approaching a level of detail closer to the arcade original than many other Model 2 ports in the system. If you look at any 3D game on the Saturn, especially if it's a port from the PlayStation, it's clear that the console has its limitations. As I've previously said, the Saturn isn't quite as good as the PlayStation in 3D performance for a number of reasons, and that's apparent in the few 3D games that appeared on both systems. Even though the Saturn is more powerful on paper, the ease that the PlayStation brought in wrangling polygons meant that Saturn often underwhelmed in practice. However, there are times when a Saturn port of a PS1 game can play shockingly close to the source material. Wipeout 2097 on Saturn, shown here in its Japanese edition, Wipeout XL, is one such game that does a remarkable job at replicating the PS1 original, brought to us yet again by Tantalus. Concessions to texture quality and frame rate had to be made, of course, and while the Saturn version isn't as pleasing in motion as the PS1 original, it's still close enough to feel like Wipeout 2097. The controls are perhaps a tad more floaty than they should be, a bit less tight and responsive, but it's a small difference that you get used to relatively quickly. Other than that, it's the same classic game, just on the Saturn. The only thing that's substantially lacking from the original is the licensed soundtrack, with the Saturn instead getting an original set of tracks by Tim Wright, or Cold Storage as he's also known. Personally, I'm not too big on these tracks, they're a bit too repetitive for my tastes. I appreciate what it's trying to go for, but it doesn't quite meet the mark in execution, at least for me. 
Though I've heard that some people prefer this version of the game just for the soundtrack, so take that as you will. But otherwise, this is a big get for the Saturn, and if you've been sleeping on this game like I was before this video, the Saturn version is a great way to introduce yourself to it. Really, there was only a small handful of 3D PlayStation ports in general, let alone ones just as good as the original. Tomb Raider was originally developed for the Saturn in mind, so it's probably no surprise how close it is to the PlayStation version. Resident Evil, Croc, and Pandemonium are among the few examples of famous polygonal PlayStation titles that got Saturn counterparts. Most of the games that the two consoles shared were 2D games, with the Saturn sometimes scoring superior versions, and any 3D titles on Saturn were usually made exclusively for it, due to its quite unique architecture which would inflate development time and budgets. So it means that lots of studios probably didn't even have the time or money to make a PlayStation version after they'd already made one for the Saturn. On the off chance that the Saturn and PlayStation both got a particular 3D game, then the Saturn version was usually done by a third party, as was the case for Resi, which was ported by Nextech. So I think that saying the library was mainly subpar ports of PlayStation titles is not only a disservice, but in a way it's probably not even true, since there's so few apples to apples comparisons you can make in the first place, at least when it comes to 3D games. And as we've seen, the Saturn can deliver superior 2D performance, so it's not like its 2D games are why it garnered such an unfavourable reputation for clunky PlayStation ports with poor frame rates. So really, I don't have the foggiest clue where this sentiment came from, since so few 3D PlayStation titles appeared on the Saturn. Perhaps PlayStation owners just recognise a few familiar names that appeared on the Saturn, some exclusives with poor frame rates that a YouTuber talked about, and judge the console's whole library based on those and whatever familiar franchises were missing. Whatever the case, it's now clear that this isn't entirely true. While a large chunk of its library also appeared on the PlayStation, many versions were superior, since most games they usually shared were 2D titles. Which, apart from selling well in the East, meant that the Saturn held its own more than it didn't. Even the Saturn's 3D, while not a pleasant experience for most developers, was brimming with potential. And when you see a 3D game really show what the Saturn's made of, it becomes clear it was capable of stellar 3D performance in the right hands. It's only natural that the Saturn, with its powerful pixel-shoving hardware and Sega's arcade pedigree, houses so many incredible arcade action games. The Saturn had ports of cult classic shooters Batsugan, Battle Garaga, Hyper Jewel, Sokyu Garantai, Guardian Force, and many many others that were often exclusive. Some 2D fighting games, mainly those from SNK and Capcom, took advantage of RAM expansions that could plug into the cartridge port, using the extra memory on Saturn to store additional animation frames compared to what the PlayStation could with its small, non-expandable memory pool. Animation frames are essential for a fighting game, so the larger pool of frame data made possible by the Saturn's large, expandable bank of memory meant reading your opponent is measurably easier. Sure, this might not matter much on a low level, but it's definitely a welcome addition for enthusiasts and high-level players. Though, the expandable memory also made possible some more immediately noticeable advantages. For instance, the Saturn version of Metal Slug. It requires a 1MB expansion cartridge, utilising it to store more of a level in memory at once, meaning the game doesn't have to stop and load the rest of a level halfway through like it does on the PlayStation. Any games that required a RAM expander would have a version bundled with the cartridge and another without it, so it's not like you were entirely left out in the cold if you didn't already have a RAM cartridge. When a game is programmed properly for Saturn, it produces comparably similar graphics to that of many PlayStation games. In fact, I'm willing to bet that, had I not told you that these were the Saturn versions, you probably wouldn't have noticed, at least not at first glance. Even ignoring neat little curios like the RAM expansion cartridges, the Saturn in its stock configuration can go head to head with the PlayStation in more ways than not. So with all the hardware talk out of the way, let's talk about Rayforce, also known as Galactic Attack, or Layer Section as I'm going to be calling it, developed by Taito as an arcade game in 1994, then ported to the Saturn by Ving in 1995, probably my favourite game for the system. It's got clear influence from Toa Plan's early bullet hell games such as Grindstormer and Batsugan, as well as Xevious with its crosshair. The background targeting in layer section works a little differently though. Instead of dropping an endless supply of bombs that are hard to aim with due to the scrolling background, hovering the reticle over an enemy will lock onto it, adding it to a finite list of targets you're able to shoot. You can lock onto upwards of 5 targets to start with, expandable to a max of 8 by collecting enough power-ups. You can also lock onto some single targets multiple times so that you can unleash a more powerful laser beam onto one particular enemy, or even a boss, to destroy it quicker. These small changes alone make the background enemies far more enjoyable to dispatch than in Xevious, since you no longer have to worry about precise positioning and button timing. Instead, it allows you to switch focus between foreground and background much more easily, since all you need to blast your locked-in background targets is a press of the B button, which you'll need to do since apart from shooting from the background, they'll often jump out of the background and into the foreground for a more full frontal assault. Plus, these changes bring about the ability for enemies to move in more complex, freeform ways that are more visually interesting. 
It also makes possible enemies that demand a bit more positional precision, since the lock-on removes the strict demands for precise button timing. It's but one example of the game's remarkably well-balanced mechanics. There is a bit of a mental stack involved, especially later in the game as enemies get more aggressive, but it's not impossible. All you need to do is just keep your eyes open and pay attention. As long as you're decently attentive, there isn't much that can go wrong that isn't your own fault. The only real limiting factor is your own skill. Which isn't something I can say about too many other shooters, where it mostly feels like luck whether or not you'll get further in the game with each attempt. The first stage helps a lot with that, being one of the best introductions to one of the most balanced and fair, yet still rigidly challenging shooter experiences I've played. It gives you ample time and space to learn how the controls and mechanics work, experiment with what you can and can't get away with, while still punishing you for getting too comfortable. It's one of the few shooters I've played where, for the most part, it meets you halfway. This is achieved through two of its major design aspects, the first being art style, in the sense that there's lots of detail just about everywhere, but the backgrounds are done with a soft, muted palette that's easy on the eyes. It's pleasing to look at without being distractingly bright or detailed. Then the enemies and bullets often have more contrasted, saturated appearances to make them easier to see against the background, as well as provide a dash more colour that the background sometimes lack. This is noteworthy because art style is critical when you have such a game as this, with so much happening on screen at once, bullets almost filling the screen, enemies in the direct path of your safe spot so you have to plan movement and attacks around, etc. Which is directly tied into the second and more important consideration, level design. Apart from looking great, the levels have varied set pieces in each. They all have memorable moments in them, which are not only cool to look at and make the world feel a bit more alive, but also helps to give a more dynamic pace to the gameplay. More importantly, their difficulty more or less gives you the room to get things wrong and learn patterns without having to grind to get anywhere. It gives you quick, instantly satisfying feedback throughout the first couple of levels. The hard part is in learning where enemies appear, how they launch offensives, and in turn, when to attack or defend. You're put more to the test with level 3 and 4 kicking it up a notch, and then level 5 and onwards giving you a punishing that only gets harder as it progresses. There's also that brilliant soundtrack by Ghouls and Ghosts composer Tamayo Kawamoto, genuinely some of the most unique, captivating shooter music out there that stands out above a genre filled with a myriad of rock pieces. It was given a special remaster for the Saturn version where new synths were chosen and various little things were tweaked. The results are, in my opinion, the definitive version of the soundtrack and is one of the very few CD remasters of arcade OSTs that enhances the original without disrupting its soul. They didn't do what the PS1 Tekken ports did, bafflingly awful rearrangements that were more technical showcases for Redbook Audio than anything else. Instead, Ving chose to let the original sound direction stand, with any changes having a clear purpose behind it to make it sound more polished in ways that sound perfectly natural. A shining example of less is more. They're not 100% identical to the originals in terms of direction, I mean there are some notable differences that you can just chalk up to personal preference, particularly with the mixing of the chords. But while I personally love the slightly warmer, more lo-fi, mid-heavy sound of the arcade version, I prefer the Saturn's more reserved sound with tighter bass, more high-end, and excellent use of reverb. All in all, it's the definitive Saturn package, an arcade action classic that truly looks, sounds, and plays like the coin-op with no compromises on any front. In some ways, it even improves on the original with the Saturn's redone music, for instance. And the best part, depending on how you look at it, is that this is an exclusive console port. It never got brought to the PlayStation. It did come to PC in 97, then inexplicably to iOS and Android in the 2010s, but in terms of home consoles, the Saturn is still the place that this game calls home. Sure, on the surface, it may not look like the most amazing shooter out there, but a game like Layer Section is much more than the sum of its parts, and when taken together as a whole, it's a pretty special game. The Saturn also houses spectacular ports of Rising's Bullet Hell Luminaries, Battle Garaga, and So Rentai, with the former being an exclusive, albeit a very late one, and the later getting a slightly inferior PlayStation version. 
Garaga is a game that took the formula established by Batsugan and Don Pachi, then not only outshone its predecessors, but also many successes in my opinion, including Dodon Pachi. If you ask me, this is the game that truly brought the bullet hell genre into its own and evolved it for the better, taking everything that worked and throwing out what didn't. Everything from the music to the art style, level design, enemy behaviour and bosses was just turned up to 11 in this game, and it's probably the finest example of a bullet hell game from the 90s. It's awesome. So Kyugurentai isn't perhaps as important to the progression of the genre as Garaga was, and it certainly doesn't stack up in just about most aspects that really matter in a shooter. Level design, art style, music, etc. But it's still nonetheless a solid shooter that's definitely worth a look in if you're a fan of the genre. Same goes for Batsugan, one of the grandfathers of Bullet Hell, ported to the Saturn by Bun Presto. It's a great port of an influential game that helped form the basis of a genre that's still around today, and while it still definitely feels like a prototype of what was to come, it still feels a bit ahead of its time in a way. Regardless of such, it's still a lovely, enjoyable shooter with a style and charm all its own. Sega were quite the creative bunch back in the day, with no shortage of ideas for original IP. And the Saturn is when they started firing on all cylinders in that respect, since their new hardware allowed for all kinds of things that were previously never possible, and their creative freedom was unfettered. Such is the case with a game like Panzer Dragoon. It's a simple rail shooter where you ride a dragon through a series of levels and bosses, shooting down anything that stands between you and the end goal. But there's a bit more going on than your standard arcade affair. In this game, the shoulder buttons on the Saturn's luscious controller swing the camera either left or right by 90 degrees, allowing you to survey your surroundings. You can't move while looking to the side or behind you, but you can still freely aim, and the game never throws too much at you at once, so it never feels cheap or unbalanced. It's one of those games that uses VDP2 to draw a flat plane here, also showing off its ability to distort those flat planes, which creates a convincing water effect for the time. It's an early in-house game for the console, so it's clear that the team is still learning how to get the most out of the Saturn's 3D performance, evident in the low resolution of many textures or the simple, bare-bones scenery. I mean, it was a North American launch game, after all. But what it lacks in pizzazz, it more than makes up for in the gameplay department, providing one of the most engaging and rewarding 3D rail shooter experiences I've ever played, comparing favourably to many of the genre's darlings, such as Star Fox. It's a game that grabs you from the start with its unique art direction, captivating soundtrack and instant, fast-paced action, and then keeps its hooks into you with enough variety in the levels to keep you on your toes. This is a great game not only to introduce you to the Saturn and what it's all about, but also to what Sega as a whole was about back then, and the kind of incredibly endearing universes they were able to create with their in-house talent. Sega were bringing more of their arcade games to the home than ever during the Saturn era, and it shows in the amount of games that they ported, even if they were a few years old. Virtua Racing is one such game that got a Saturn port five years after its arcade release, when it already had ports on the Mega Drive and 32X by this point, but the result is arguably the definitive version of the game. Yes, it slows down a bit here and there, and yes, the physics aren't the same as the original, but that personally doesn't bother me, since I wasn't a fan of how the original VR controlled anyway. Here, the more slippery, slidey feel of the cars is a bit more forgiving and helps to give the game a bit more of an arcadey feel to its driving. Plus, the amount of new content in this game that's lacking from previous versions is what makes this my favourite one. It expands upon the extra tracks and car types found in the 32X version and takes that up a notch further with even more tracks and vehicle types to play with, which, despite all being made out of flat-shaded, single-colour polygons, manage to look thematically distinct from each other. It even has a career mode in which you climb up the ranks of sorts by unlocking faster vehicle types and more tracks to race on as the game progresses. All in all, it's the most well-rounded version of one of Sega's arcade classics, which goes for the rest of the system's arcade ports as a whole. Steam Gear Mash by Tamsoft is a relatively early title for the console, being released only 10 months after the system came out. It's an isometric platformer shooter kind of game with a hint of exploration to it. There are blockades in each level that prevent progress, and you need to look in each room to find the permanent power-ups required to destroy them in order to move on. It's kind of like a scaled-back version of a Metroidvania game, but with more of a focus on the game's shooting and platforming, rather than exploration and atmosphere. Those permanent upgrades are limited on ammo, however. Should the blue meter deplete, you can't use them anymore, until you find ammo pickups. But everything's paced and designed well enough that it never really becomes much of a problem, and farming doesn't take exactly long either. 
There's also alternate firing modes as well. One allows you to stand still and aim, another lets you lock your aim in place while you move, another shoots around you in a circle, etc. Allowing more versatility to the player in approaching combat situations, and more leeway to the developers in creating more perilous levels without it becoming unfair. You won't encounter problems like falling off the map while trying to aim at an enemy, because the movement can be uncoupled from the aiming whenever you like. There's also bosses which await you at the end of each level, with liberal use of power-ups often encouraged to kill them faster, otherwise your little pea shooter won't do you much good, at least if you want to finish the game while you're still young. Every once in a while it turns into a 2D shooter where power-ups are also advised for use, since there's enemies just about everywhere, basically filling the screen most of the time. It's a game that's got a bit more going on than just run through and shoot everything, instead employing a non-linear approach to simple platforming and corridor shooting with compact levels to make backtracking less of a bore. It's honestly a unique little game, and even though it's definitely not perfect in many regards, there's magic in its heart that makes it enjoyable to play nonetheless. It feels like an evolution of the kind of games that were popular on the Mega Drive, a simple, 2D action game with some more meat on its bones to keep you engaged for hours at a time practicing. It's one of the last hurrahs for an era when video games were simpler, more pure at heart creations that didn't have the baggage of blockbuster polish and cinematic stories attached to them. Such market demands killed many small teams that specialised in games like this, where production values were nice but not essential, a time when gameplay loop was still king. Tamsoft was lucky enough to survive this turbulent time for these kinds of games, and they're still around today, but many others were not so fortunate. In fact, Sega themselves largely struggled with the changing tides of the industry. This is evidenced during the creation of Panzer Dragoon Saga, one of the first video games to feature an almost fully voice-acted, content-rich story, and therefore one of the first games of its kind made by the company. This game also had numerous other stresses put on the team during its arduous time in development hell, but the sheer scale of the game's story, FMV and voice acting all combined would not have helped matters whatsoever, especially given the fact that Sega were ill-equipped to tackle these kinds of elements that were becoming progressively more essential for many kinds of games to sell well, let alone RPGs. The Saturn was made during a much different time in Sega's life, during a time when they had nothing to gain and everything to lose. And Sega very much did end up losing everything by the time the Saturn era was over, with the company collapsing in such spectacular fashion in such a short span of time. It only took them seven short years to go from one of the largest players in the industry to near bankrupt and about to close their doors. But despite all that, the Saturn still managed to come out the other end swinging regardless. It's insane to think that, during the time Sega was bleeding cash more or less every day, things didn't look that different to Japanese players or Western diehard Sega fans that grew up with the Saturn. The Saturn's games were plentiful and high in quality, it was doing a lot of what the PlayStation did in its early years, and Sega were making more graphically impressive arcade classics than ever, games that often still had fantastic home ports made of them. Sega had to try so much harder to get the Japanese success they attained. They hadn't really tapped into the Japanese home market until the Saturn, so achieving success would definitely necessitate the pursuit of third-party titles and creation of enticing, original IP that gave the Saturn killer apps. Since Sega were very flush with cash after the Mega Drive's western success, as well as their various victories in the arcades, they could spare to empty out the coffers required for the Saturn to achieve what it did in Japan, but not if the system failed in the west. Which it did, and by the end of the generation, despite their best, most valiant efforts, the PlayStation would greatly overtake the Saturn in Japan before the 90s were over. Yet the Saturn soldiered on for a couple more years regardless, still getting games made for it as late as 2000, with Capcom's Final Fight Revenge being the final game on the system. The Saturn was discontinued in Japan around that time, and combined with its earlier release, meant it lasted literally twice as long in the East than it did in the West. In any case, it's only natural that I fell in love with the Saturn so quickly. Most of the games I play tend to be arcade action games from the 90s, so knowing that, it's probably no surprise to you what I like about the Saturn. It's so great that I had a hard time writing the games part of the script because, well, which fantastic game do you want to play? Virtual on, Tempest 2000, Magic Knight Ray Earth, Knights into Dreams, Virtual Cop, Resident Evil, Metal Slug, Vampire Savior, there is simply no end to the Saturn's wide breadth of classics, whether exclusive or not. If you're a fan of 16-bit or even PlayStation games, then you'll find something to love about the Sega Saturn. There's just so many endearing things about this little machine, and if you ask me, it doesn't deserve the maligned reputation among gamers that it seems to have these days. Even though it contributed to Sega's most turbulent time in its existence, the Saturn was just so fantastic despite that. It kind of sits in this weird in-between of notoriety and obscurity. It's notable because it's made by Sega, one of the biggest companies in the console space that was severely crippled to the point of near collapse by one of its final hardware creations. 
but it's also obscure because barely anybody knows about the true extent of its library or even the nuance behind why the Saturn console itself arguably didn't kill Sega. People didn't buy the console because of a lack of brand loyalty and consumer trust. It was a brutal consequence of a series of missteps and extenuating circumstances, one so huge that people lost interest in the company as a whole, let alone the Saturn. Turns out, just like any piece of history, the Saturn's successes and failures are multifaceted and tell a more complicated story that, sadly, goes largely overlooked. It's an unusually cruel fate for a system that was criminally underlooked during its time to remain just about as obscure during a time when retro gaming is more popular than ever. And hell, who knows if this video will do anything to change how people perceive the Saturn whatsoever. But if this video has made even just one person curious to jump into the library having liked what they saw, then I think this video will definitely have been worth it. And if you're that kind of person, I suggest you hop to it immediately. If you're not exactly in the market for real Saturn hardware, I don't blame you, but a fantastic multi-system emulator by the name of Mednafen will do the job wonderfully. It's command line only, but you can fix that with the Mednafi frontend, which makes configuring and using Mednafen wonderfully straightforward. I'll have links to both of these in the description. Mednafen recommends that the Saturn be run on a quad-core Haswell system, so from about 2014 or so, for best performance. However, both my Ivy Bridge ThinkPad and Linfield, yes, Linfield, Vostro from 2012 and 2010 respectively, can run almost the whole library at full speed. There's still some moments of slowdown here and there with some of the more demanding games like Thunder Force 5, Sega Rally, and Panzer Dragoon, but nothing too awful, and it's usually short and infrequent enough to not bother me. So basically, if you have a PC made within the last 10 years or so, you'll be able to run Saturn games just fine. You'll need to supply your own BIOS and game files, and how you do that is up to you, but should you decide to go through with it, I hope the Saturn captivates you just as much as it did me. It's easily my favourite 5th gen console, and its fantastic library of games made it so within a very short span of time. I do enjoy the PlayStation, and I am obliged to love the N64 since it was my first ever console, but Saturn is the planet that I call home. A planet that houses some of the most out there titles in the universe, some of the most special, finely crafted retro gaming experiences the likes of which few can replicate. If you're a retro gamer, I'd say you owe it to yourself to at least give the Saturn a chance. Starry skies, grand adventure, and burning rubber await you on your journeys across planet Saturn, lying in wait for you to skim the surface and dig down into its core. So what are you waiting for? Shoot!